My name is Maria Grigorieva. I'm junior associate at TPA Global, and I'm presenting today uh, with Steve Harbrestin, our senior partner and CEO. Steve, welcome. Thanks, uh, Mary. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to all of you uh, for joining this uh, this uh, fourth uh, session on value chain analysis by uh, by TPA Global. Uh, the the combination today will be we will be looking at uh, the whole value chain analysis and, and, and how that plays a role in your defense line for uh, for tax and trans pricing controversy. So we we'll, we look at the slide and we will um, deal uh, with the, the whole alignment um, of uh, facts and, and sharing tax sensitive data with tax authorities through various channels. Um, after which we will address uh, how to deal with tax sensitive data and, and we will introduce to you a new concept called uh, tax sensitive data disclosure policy after which we will give you an example on a value chain both from a qualitative and quantitative approach perspective and then at that stage we will start combining the uh, value chain um, with uh, with dispute avoidance and dispute resolution tools. Um, at, at the end, we will address also some comments on co corporate governance. And then in this case, corporate governance in, in, is in who within corporates should be doing what uh, on these uh, uh, tax sensitive data points in disclosing it to, uh, to various stakeholders. Um, finally, we will address um, the set of boundaries which seem to apply, especially in, in the EU, to all business models. Um, so we're, we're not isolating uh, isolating tax away from uh, other aspects, uh, as we seem to to be um, in, as, as are important, like state aid and uh, and other EU loop. EU law considerations and we will close that uh, the session today with a few lessons learned. Mary take uh, take it forward on the next slide please. Yes. Uh, I would like to remind our attendees that you can ask your questions uh, through the uh, go to webinar panel there is a uh, panel uh, called questions you can type your questions there and we will answer them in the end of the webinar. So we would like to start uh, with the compliance matters uh, and as financial year is, a, and is approaching, um, most of the corporates are now busy with the compliance matters, the master files, CYC and tax returns. However, the main issues will not be the extraction of data for CYC uh, or fulfillment of tax note forms. The real challenge will be first to align the data that you are disclosing in uh, not only all this resources but also local files, also transfer pricing forms and other disclosure channels. Secondly, uh, all this data may produce some outliers and you will need to think how to address them uh, and in order to prevent tax disputes. Lastly, and the main point is that uh, these three channels will disclose 100% uh, of value chain of an uh, M&E And in this slide, uh, we would like to make our statement. Yeah, Mary. Well, if we go back to that uh, that, that slide before, uh, I think in essence, if you if you disclose all of this information uh, through a master file, um, uh, which tells uh, the tax inspector in 12 months from now something about the value chain, CBCR, which does the same but then in, uh, expressed in data points and you, the tax return is only taking the individual transactions relevant for your country, then the tax inspector who receives all that data on his, um, on his table can start aligning and matching and, and, and quite quickly also come up with the, the differences in these three layers of information shared with the tax authorities on a mandatory basis effectively for 1 1 2016 so I think this is one big source of sharing tax sensitive data with a lot of 
potential mismatches. That's true. That's why we make the statement that we think that voter tax transparency means actually full value chain analysis. And the main question is, are you ready for this? Uh, because G20 uh, is really pushing towards full tax transparency and uh, other even non-OECD countries are now joining this trend. So we think uh, that to be in control, you actually need to, uh, to have a full value chain analysis. Uh, the second point uh, is even being in the spotlight, uh, you still should have some disclosure policy in mind and it should not be uh, just in the mind of head of tax, but it should be a written policy, preferably signed off by CFO. And this policy may define uh, what is actually sensitive data for your company, uh, and what are your uh, 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 what are your channels of disclosure. As for example, we know that now 50% of tax adjustments uh, are uh, a consequence of some disclosure by journalists. So would you like your data to be disclosed in the magazine or would you like it to be disclosed on your website or maybe in your 10K file? Also, you need to think of the levels of access because we know that other 50% of data is probably disclosed by disgruntled employees and other kinds of whistleblowers. Uh, and this disclosure policy should be uh, a part of the overall corporate governance and tax matters. Uh, such governments may include control framework and other policies. And uh, as Steve mentioned, we will address corporate governance and tax matters uh, later today. Yeah, um, a point on this, Mary, the disclosure policy. So, so if, if we say full tax transparency might not be heading you today, but maybe tomorrow. Um, that means, are you ready to share any tax sensitive data to all stakeholders real time um, uh, through any channel upon, re uh, upon request or even spontaneously? Uh, that's, that's really the, the uh, point of attention here. Um, the, the fact that um, people are not very explicit about what tax sensitive data is. In, in the Netherlands, we have a concept called horizontal supervision. So you, you meet with the tax authorities and you agree on certain treatment of certain items in your balance sheet, your tax balance sheet and, and profit and loss account. You put it on paper, you both sign it. Um, is that uh, information tax sensitive information uh, or 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 not, and and how do you disclose it? Do you put it in a, in an intranet where everyone in the group can can actually look at it, or do you want to keep that in a more restricted circulation, uh, only accessible for the uh, senior people in the in-house uh, tax team? Uh, that's that's a very um, lively example we've been discussing with one of our clients. So coming back to value chain. I think the real struggle for everybody is now what it should include, what is the approach, should it be quantifiable, should, be, should it be qualifiable. This is one of the examples of qualifiable approach where you define what uh, part of the value chain each entity is representing, uh, where the main part is, uh, of course, the residual represented by uh, matchmaking on uh, intangible or investment center and matchmaking uh, on uh, supply chain, which is a profit center. And other uh, parts of the value chain are uh, just, uh, can be defined by usual TP methods where the residual, which is actually the main part of profit, uh, should be uh, more thoroughly split between uh, those uh, entities. Yeah, the, 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 this is uh, what uh, TPA usually refers to as a technique to value chain analysis. So there, there's other techniques how to visualize a value chain and how to determine uh, the portion you want to highlight. That this uh, technique too is called a Porter's, uh, Michael Porter's type of uh, value chain analysis. Um, most of you will be familiar with um, this technique, this visualization typically 
uh, is applicable in cases where the value chain does allow you to carve out a, 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 the more routine functions um, separately and compensate them separately as, uh, as visualized in this, uh, in this slide, which means you, at the end of the day, are left with a residual portion which gets split between uh, the investment center and the profit center. Uh, and in order, uh, we are taking now one step further, uh, because as you see, to define the split of residual for investment center, you need to apply certain filters. And we developed uh, what we call a funnel approach, uh, where you uh, start with identity functions, and you define which entities are involved uh, in the performance of this function. Then you need to define which entities are not only performing the functions, but also uh, are involved in management of the risk, uh, still related to development, uh, enhancement, maintenance, protection, and exploitation. Uh, third level uh, is to define whether entities that are managing risk are absorbing the cost, uh, which is the result of this risk. Fourth is to define, actually, uh, other employees uh, involved in the uh, performance function, function and in management of intangible. Filter five and six are more uh, entity specific or uh, M&E specific. Uh, and here we suggest that in order to manage intangibles, there should be at least five uh, qualified employees on the payroll uh, of an entity uh, which wants to be entitled for the residual. And filter six uh, is, uh, is coming from our client's experience. Uh, where there are two entities, and one of them is in Switzerland and another is in Germany. And German entity was managing the brand for over 50 years, and now it's transferring the brand to Swiss entity. And the Swiss entity is managing only for two years. So in this situation, it is very important to take into account uh, the years of involvement, because you cannot uh, compare uh, the uh, amount of residual go into the entity that just obtained the rights to the intangible and didn't really contribute to its value. So applying all the six filters, uh, you will actually come up with the entity uh, that will be entitled uh, to the portion of the residual related to the management of intangible. Yeah, uh, Mary, just to recap, I think if uh, just as an example, you throw in all your 400 legal entities in the group uh, in the top of the funnel and you might be ending up with uh, only four of the legal entities uh, being entitled to this residual portion uh, because they they meet all the filters um, uh, that's that's just how this this funnel approach works uh, what we should warn you on and that I think Mary you already mentioned that uh, filter one to four is fairly OECD compliant and specific uh, filter five and six needs to be made more industry specific and multinational specific um, and, and obviously ha carries a degree of subjectivity uh, when you start applying these filters so require a little bit more uh, backing uh, by, uh, by arguments uh, why you think these uh, filters are, uh, are applicable in this particular case. Um, just to make sure, is there any questions on the on the? Okay, yeah. not yeah. No. So we are now moving, I think, to the most interesting part of our today's webinar: is a quantifiable approach. Uh, and here we suggest uh, an example uh, how to define to divide uh, not the full value chain but how to actually def uh, define uh, the parts that are going to uh, residual and the part is going to routine and then how to split the residual part. So here you will see some assumptions we made uh, where the company's EBIT uh, equals to 15% and we attributed 5% to routine function. Uh, which may be finance activities, contract manufacturing, contract R&D, and other uh, and support services. Uh, we should mention that uh, these assumptions are, uh, especially assumption uh, on the routine function, uh, is an M&E specific, and 
the number can of course vary from industry to industry. Uh, so carving out 5%, we are uh, left with a residual profit of 10%, which we need to split between the matchmaker and intangibles and matchmaker on supply chain. Uh, we can benchmark uh, the royalties that have to be uh, paid to uh, for for the exploitation of intangibles, uh, and we can also define uh, the industry specific EBIT. Uh, so coming up with a split, as as you may see, uh, of 2.5 percent going to investment center and 7.5 percent going to profit center role. And again, I would like to to note that these are only the assumptions, and in order to perform this uh, actual split. Uh, you need to perform thorough benchmarking and uh, analysis and also analysis of company specifics. Yeah, this is uh, uh, pharma specific. Uh, there's there's a um, an article uh, Mary and me published in BNA recently on this, and we're working out what. Uh, the quantifiable versions, uh, not only of pharma, but also of medical equipment and, and other industries in the subsequent articles, um, which will be published in the coming months at the BNA. Um, one notification there, almost like a health warning, that the, the traditional way to split an investment, the residual profit between an investment center being the licensor in a lot of cases and the uh, profit center being the licensee um, is uh, the rule of thumb uh, which is being applied by a lot of professionals which typically says that 25 to 33 percent of the profit should land at the level of the licensor and the rest uh, is left at the level of the licensee. Um, well we can assure you in, in the various industries this cookie cutter approach doesn't apply anymore. So I think that's that's just a safe, um, that's a, that's an advanced health warning, uh, which if you apply this type of technique on, on your, your industry, on your specific case, you will uh, quickly find out that uh, that rule of thumb uh, might still apply occasionally, but certainly not uh, as, a, as a, a general applicable uh, rule of um, uh, applied on on, uh, on many cases. Okay. Uh, and we are now moving to actual managing of controversy, which uh, we call dispute avoidance and dispute resolution. And in this chart, you may see that uh, there are four dimensions in which you can resolve or avoid the dispute. And uh, for example, if we look at the uh, right upper corner, uh, we will see multilateral and proactive tools that you can use as, for example, multilateral APAs. And if we look at the left down corner, we see uh, reactive and unilateral tools as, for example, going to a local course to resolve your case. Uh, these tools are commonly available in most countries with some exceptions. Uh, and we, of course, prefer and we recommend uh, to use the tools on the right side, which are proactive. Uh, however, sometimes you still may, um, may uh, end up uh, using the reactive tools. Uh, and in both cases, uh, you can apply value chain as a tool to manage controversy. Yeah, there's, um, there's a notion, if we go one back, uh, there's a notion that uh, traditionally transfer pricing disputes were uh, running the cycle of tax audits, uh, maybe with some arbitrage uh, ending up in, in extreme cases in local courts. Um, I would call uh, transpising a, a topic certainly after the introduction of DEMPI, um, as we've seen uh, in, the, in the funnel description uh, a few slides earlier. I wouldn't call the DEMPI analysis uh, very suitable for a local judge to put a verdict on. So the more proactive, more multilateral approach to uh, mitigate your risk in the BAPS arena um, is, is really the, 
the way to go, although I I put um, a reservation that not for all industries and not for all geographies um, a multilateral APA is, is easy to achieve or does uh, mitigate the risk uh, in, um, in a material way. So you need to make some uh, judgment statements before going in uh, with, uh, with that, that approach. Um, the next uh, slide you see here is uh, another way to visualize this value chain. We've been looking at this Michael Porter's value chain visualization. And this is a little bit more abstract version of that same, where you, ha you compensate sales, manufacturing, and other. Uh, could be guarantee fees, uh, could be interest rates. And, and you compensate services with uh, a portion um, through a cost plus or an operating margin with a portion of, uh, of your EBIT line of your operating margin and you're left with a residual. Um, here the, the question uh, comes up, okay, is the residual a one-year approach or is the residual a multi-year approach? Because if, say, three group companies get each one-third in year one, the, the second year, uh, A gets 40, B gets 40, and C gets 20. Um, in year three, uh, the, the allocation uh, of the residual is again different. Um, you need to start thinking of a multi-year approach uh, to allocation of the residual profits. If you do a multi-year approach to the allocation of that residual profit, uh, you get very close, and that's why it's mentioned here to a valuation-based allocation. Uh, so you're, 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 you do actually involve valuation techniques uh, to to be used as part of your allocation um, technique. Uh, so that's A. If we if we then look at B, uh, it it's trying to combine each of the boxes in the value chain with uh, the um, the visual we we just uh, the, the dispute uh, resolution and avoidance toolbox we were addressing in the previous slide. So if you take services for headquarters, shared services, uh, sh shared service centers, or BUs, typically an ISO certificate, uh, which is these days available for transfer pricing purposes as well. Um, or a safe harbor could be the way to go and defend your position. Uh, nothing complex, nothing over the top, um, but at a, uh, fit for purpose. If you take sales and manufacturing, uh, maybe uh, a unilateral or a multilateral APA would be uh, the approach. And, and sometimes, and that's sort of what OECD is working on, on as well, they believe they can come up with uh, industry standards. So what is a typical return of a production plan for cars um, to be applied across the car uh, manufacturing industry is, is sort of uh, the, the industry standard OECD has been thinking uh, about. I, I'm not sure how far they got on, on the buy-in from, from corporates. If you take specific transactions like royalties, interest, and, and guarantees, which would be part of this other category, um, they typically are addressed through other processes. Why? Because a lot of tax authorities don't want to give APAs on interest rates and royalty rates because they say they're too unique. Um, um, therefore, there's hardly any evidence, uh, any comparables, which is uh, supporting your unique case. Uh, I think the same applies to guarantees. Um, although uh, occasionally it's possible to, to put them in into um, a sub-paragraph of an APA w without overstating what, um, what you agree on uh, with the tax authority. So you could agree on the technique you're using, not necessarily on the level of the guarantee fee or the level of the royalty. 
And then uh, last but not least, I think the residual, and here we go again, you, you would go into the direction um, if, if more than 50% of your profit is residual, and that needs to be allocated amongst the 10 group entities um, with a different percentage uh, each other year, then you would like to get some certainty uh, on on that allocation standard. So multi multilateral APAs could then be the the better way. If if you don't do that, you might end up uh, say in an EU zone into an uh, arbitration convention type of setup, which, as we know from experience, is not the, the most flexible um, or a fast tool to get a, a resolution of your double taxation. Um, or you could sort of use the MAP procedure because the MAP procedure typically looks at the future but also might allow you to close some other disputes from the past. Uh, so this is trying to uh, come up with a full value chain analysis. Why? Because there's a full transparency of, uh, of tax sensitive data and, and your value chain and mapping it against which tool are you going to be using to defend which position. I think that uh, lands the questions under C, uh, which disputes to handle, which toolbox uh, to use, what is the timing of the risk management and, and what professional process to use uh, where in the past it typically was we have a process when we get attacked. I think this this process is much more proactive uh, by by its very nature. Uh, both from you have a full value chain analysis as well as you upfront have already agreed which uh, risk mitigation tool uh, from the toolbox to use. That means it puts you much more in the driver seat when whenever a dispute comes up. Um, we we switch gears here. We say, okay, what what's the what's the link between value chain analysis and, and corporate governance? Uh, there's uh, there's a few layers of corporate governance we're going to address. Uh, the first one is is the generic BAPS comes uh, comes up with. So in the pre BAPS stage, we always say, okay, what how you run your business model how you um, have drafted your intercompany legal agreements and how you cook the books in, in a financial sense need to be aligned realities. So they need to be synchronized. Uh, um, if they're not synchronized, uh, you have uh, too many, as I call them, uh, Bermuda, Bermuda triangles, uh, which in, in tax terminology typically would mean PE type of risks. So that was a, a very easy way to say, okay, if as long as I have two out of three, uh, I might feel comfortable uh, to uh, to run and defend my transpricing scenario. What did BAPS change in that uh, triangle? Well, no, not not much. This triangle still applies, but it added another layer uh, where the operating model and and the corporate governance. So how People functions make value, uh, make decisions which create value. Um, is is your corporate governance on how to run uh, a, a business model, how to operate um, an uh, an operating model from an autonomy perspective? So if you have the lead sales guy uh, on the payroll in the UK and he's really performing that function on behalf of the principal in Switzerland. Uh, then obviously your operating model, and, and let's assume the uh, the whole legal title runs through a Belgium entity, then your operating model and your corporate governance model are somewhat uh, uh, not in sync and, and are hard to capture in a consistent manner in your finance, tax, and TP system. That means a lot of disputes um, um, under the under the BAPS set of uh, of rules. Well, this is sort of the um, the way 
you could uh, assess very quickly which risks you run uh, in the area of finance, uh, tax, and transfer pricing. If we now try to translate it, and that's sort of the next slide, to a corporate governance model, um, first let, let me address what corporate governance really means, because it's a very difficult word, and most people uh, have a hard time understanding it uh, from the outside. In, in this scenario, a corporate governance model means uh, a, a pledge of a multinational to comply with the rules of the countries they operate in. That's as simple as it is. So you, you as a corporate, um, issue such a pledge by putting it on a piece of paper, by putting it on your website. That's great, but the legal entity cannot commit uh, or cannot be held accountable. So you need to translate it to a control framework, which is nothing else than translating it to an org chart with people on it, where people are uh, the actors on behalf, behalf of that legal entity, which can be kept accountable for certain things. That's not where it stops, because once you appointed people to do something, these people start issuing policies. And, and the policies could be on business, could be on finance, could be on tax, and even on transfer pricing, with, uh, as the ultimate way of uh, applying these policies, um, they get implemented and they get applied to individual transactions, uh, even into company transactions. That's the communication from the left to the right, which obviously also means um, some of you will have uh, that autonomy to, uh, you will be involved in the uh, control framework and, 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 and be accountable for certain policies. And, and or the successful implementation of that policy into uh, the organization. But that also means you have a reporting line back, and the reporting line back um, triggers um, all sorts of uh, issues. And uh, corporate governance models are different uh, in different parts of the world. So there's um, different corporate governance models in the US, in Sweden, and Switzerland. Uh, so you need to take that into account. What you need to in, in, take into account as well as part of BAPS, uh, BAPS has segregated good tax things from bad tax things. Uh, the, the, the current way with governments is to put a liability on the persons who are accountable for the bad tax things. Uh, that's the liability issues of boards. So if your CEO wants to be um, appointed the legal representative of your 60 uh, legal entities in the 60 countries you have operations in, it, it would be wise to say, okay, uh, that, that, that is only advisable if, if that CEO or CFO is also fully aware and in control on areas on tax and transfer pricing. Why? Because the liability side of, uh, of transfer pricing and tax issues becomes very, um, uh, comes very much to the surface. I think recent legislation in the UK and Australia is a good example of that. Uh, so this is in general what, what we are looking at as a concept. If we now start applying it on the, the, the governance models for the tax, uh, for tax in practice, and we look at the next slide and we say, okay, uh, the pledge to society was made, but no one translated that to real people uh, in an org chart on a payroll in a certain location. And so yes, the corporate governance was made. Someone uh, in, from legal made some policy papers and, and hoped that, uh, that the operations would stick to those policies, but no one really is accountable for tax uh, specifics and the transfer pricing specifics, um, all of you probably would say, well, who would be so stupid not to organize a control framework and appoint people there? Well, it's not always that simple. I think BAPS has put uh, much more pressure on, on keeping people accountable on tax and transfer pricing matters than ever before. So in the past, it was never that much of an issue. 
so here the questions are what what happens if there's no clear division of roles and responsibilities on tax matters um, one example um, who signs off on the country by country report and the tax returns uh, we assume that the data points in the C by C are uh, somewhat relate to your tax return data points. At least they tell the same story. Maybe CBCR is, is done in US GAAP and IFRS, and your tax returns are in local uh, tax uh, GAAP. Uh, still, there, there needs to be someone who makes sure that these uh, data points tell the same story and reflect the same business model and and someone should sign off on that um, who in your organization signs off on the tax returns and um, is that the same person who also signs off on the the data points included in table one two and three of the country by country reporting or not uh, let me give you another example um, and there's the, the Chinese tax authorities just issued a notice 42 which requires uh, multinationals with operations in China to display and describe a full value chain analysis uh, effectively per 112016 onwards so you make a value chain analysis let's assume you make the Michael Porter's uh, version and you need to explain as part of that, uh, it's part of the local TP documentation, by the way, in China, you, you need to explain um, the financials of all the, of the actors in the value chain plus the allocation key, how the total profit in that value chain was allocated, especially taking into account the location specific factors for China. Uh, that's typically high on the wish list of the, um, of the NTA of the Chinese tax authorities so this is a lot of data which also could be commercially sensitive who's signing off on this data is that defined in your organization or not uh, we, we come across a lot of organizations which have defined uh, someone signing off the tax return but have not made the connect with these liabilities issues which have come up recently more more than ever in the tax arena certainly not a lot of people have been thinking about these recent developments and how to organize uh, that to uh, a person or a group uh, who is accountable held accountable for the sign-offs on, on these type of items so this is this is one example where the control framework really is, is missing uh, the allocation of the roles to on, on specific items if we take the next slide then um, this is one group I've been talking to recently they have uh, about 15 transporting people and they are typically um, there to talk to the business operations if the business operations enters into a transaction the uh, 15 people will recommend what is the appropriate transfer pricing method and what is the level of compensation to the parties in the group involved um, it, it happens on a very operational level so it, it's applying each time a case comes up uh, because there's not a lot of commonality between transactions at least not uh, from the outset uh, there's not a clear set of policies on intercompany uh, flow of goods, on intercompany flow of loans, guarantees, uh, royalty rates, etc., which which creates an issue. Uh, so, in this case, the question is, uh, what happens uh, if your TP documentation captures mostly individual transactions while there's no written policy? Uh, policy just to clarify is a two-pager which tells you about the actors in a certain transaction uh, what method to apply and what the level of compensation under that method could be typically indicating which of the entities is responsible for for documenting and tracking what portion of that transaction 
uh, where the written policy typically gets signed off by the board. So you as an in-house tax and transfer pricing person would be uh, backed up that someone like the CFO has looked at it and even in some cases the whole board that this policy paper is really a fair reflection on the specific transactions uh, or the value chain um, that the company is running. Uh, so it's also a, um, a way to communicate to the uh, board what you are doing is relevant for, uh, for business. So the, the question uh, here uh, which came up in, in one of our cases, uh, if, if there's an absence of policy but suddenly the whole value chain that is one particular case where uh, a company in the pharma industry put its full value chain on its uh, uh, CS, CSR uh, uh, portion of the website um, where, where it was clear what certain policy statements were, were re relating to certain types of transactions. Well, can, uh, can you use that uh, value chain analysis on the CSR as a, a, um, um, a default policy which the tax inspector can rely on and if um, the full value chain is already on your CSR uh, website were you involved in, in putting it there or was it the uh, public relationship uh, uh, department of your company which was dealing with that. So again alignment and synchronization in this case also with uh, the uh, financial departments like the CFO and, uh, who should sign off on a written policy or with the public relationships who might have disclosed already a policy um, in, uh, without involving any one of you. Um, a, a next slide is, is sort of uh, known to a lot of uh, my clients at least uh, where uh, the, 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 the question is a little bit, yes, you have made the pledge, yes, you have, have appointed the people and even you did a, a good job in allocating roles and responsibilities. You even have policies in place, but the only thing you've done is document the policies. Why? Because you can get the right data, you can get, uh, the, and, and this is sort of the lineup, there's no financials available on the intercompany transactions. Um, your financials are not measured against your TP policies or your financials tell a different story than your TP policy. So this is the area where a lot of automation kicks in where uh, obviously the first cycle, the dry run of the CBCR, uh, again that's typically in, under IFRS and, uh, and US GAAP, has triggered a lot of, uh, well a lot of uh, at least some surprises to some uh, some of you uh, because that was the first time people were actually looking at financials and 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 performed an outlier anal analysis uh, to see whether these financials were a fair reflection of a fair distribution of the profits based on the, on the policies which were in place. So this is just a very simple exercise uh, taking a generic corporate governance model for tax and practice to assess whether you in-house uh, are, are in control on, on dealing with these uh, steps uh, of, uh, of fully implementing tax and, and, and transfer pricing policies with the right people. Um, against the pledge made to society and why is that important because full full value chain and uh, sorry full tax transparency just simply requires uh, you are uh, fully in control on this process and you have a defined process to actually mitigate the risks uh, coming from that I, I think in, in all honesty uh, some believe that CBCR is, is going to be the end of the of the train called transparency under BAP, BAPS. Um, I, I believe that uh, another Panama um, affair 
uh, be, being released to the market could trigger um, tax authorities in uh, in the EU, uh, sorry, the governments in the EU even to uh, mandate uh, corporates to put their a selection of their country by country reporting on their website. Well, that means it's uh, it's public domain. Okay, um, would there be any questions uh, raised through the? Um, just we are looking. Uh, the attendees, I just would like to remind you that you can ask your questions uh, in a questions uh, panel uh, of your GoToWebinar. webinar. Okay, a, a little bit stepping aside from from what what we've dealt with. So we looked at um, we looked at uh, value chains. Uh, we looked at controversy models, so we combined them, we said, okay, to control all of that, you need a disclosure policy and you need to have some organizational BAPS readiness in place through a corporate governance on, on tax matters. Uh, that's what we dealt with so far. Um, the, the next slide uh, you, you're looking at is, is taking a slightly different approach uh, and but is certainly in the in the EU setting very important and and that is the approach where uh, you run a business model and you you are able to visualize that business business model through a value chain analysis both qualitative and quantitatively and you need to see whether the, the following four sets of, of rules uh, and, and boundaries are applicable to that business model. So you run um, a business model in Europe, you need to be looking at the EU law aspects. Uh, typically, I would be talking uh, state aid type of issues. If you run a business model in, the, in, in Europe, you need to be looking at EU tax when it comes to the uh, uh, the uh, implementation of this uh, anti-tax uh, avoidance directive, uh, you need to take that into account uh, and when that is going to hit specifically your business model. Then on top of that, you, you, you're looking, although it looks like state aid is, um, is, is integrated uh, with the EU Commission's view on transfer pricing, in, in reality, it, it almost seems to uh, to be integrated in the Starbucks and the Apple case, but if you look very carefully, state aid is the um, the norm the EU Commission imposed on a, a specific country or tax authorities, uh, while addressing that state aid concern in the Starbucks, in the Fiat, and the, and the Apple case, the EU Commission has been using its own set of terminology um, of uh, a, a prudent independent operator, uh, which is terminology which is not, we are not very familiar with. Uh, if, if, uh, if you would be reading the OECD guidelines on transfer pricing only, so we we also see that the business model should be compliant with the EU Commission's definition on transfer pricing, uh, which again seems to be different from the OECD's definition on transfer pricing and value chain analysis. So uh, here is another way of, of looking at uh, controversy uh, management, uh, both the avoidance and the uh, resolution. Uh, by having your business model assessed from these four angles, uh, you will be better prepared in addressing uh, all of the angles at the same time. Uh, the, the example I gave a little bit earlier, uh, which is now uh, actually at, at stake in, in the discussion with the uh, EU Commission, is whether this hor horizontal supervision the Dutch authorities uh, are entering into with taxpayers and I think similar um, similar ways of communication upfront communication between tax authorities and tax payers is happening in other countries as well if um, if 
a write-up of a meeting on horizontal supervision is being signed by both parties um, and and it fixes a um, a margin of a commissionaire in another country would that not suddenly become uh, very suspicious from a state aid from a um, EU Commission on transfer pricing, uh, sorry, an EU's, EU Commission's definition on transfer pricing, if the EU can state that uh, maybe this is uh, OECD proof transfer pricing because you have a, a benchmark supporting it, but we cannot imagine in this particular case uh, that a fixation of your uh, EBIT line of your operating margin of 2% for 10 years is in line with economic reality and therefore suddenly what seems to be acceptable for the OECD definition on transfer pricing and might not even be captured by the anti-tax avoidance directive uh, at the level of EU tax might be fully captured under this different set of definitions and rules the EU Commission comes up. So suddenly you have an APA you feel comfortable because you think you can go to sleep and, and, and also report your CFO that he can, uh, he, he can uh, sleep well at night on tax matters. But suddenly there's another actor in the game uh, which uh, supersedes the, the discussion you just had finished uh, by closing and signing an APA with the, the local tax inspector. So this is sort of the next uh, a set of considerations uh, which I think from a technical perspective not everyone has per se already uh, been applying in in, uh, in its own uh, set of facts. Okay, that's I think um, most of today if we say what what is the lessons learned from from this this whole uh, webinar today I think uh, the trend of full transparency uh, has arrived and is here to stay. Uh, that, that's my humble view. That means you want to be in control uh, uh, of your tax and transfer pricing matters. That, that requires you to do a full value chain analysis. Otherwise, you're giving uh, points of data or qualitative uh, statements away on the value chain you, you don't know about uh, because you, you didn't do your homework or you don't have the holistic picture to defend yourself. Um, that requires you to say what is my three um, least favorite channels I want to disclose this data to, uh, to stakeholders and what is my three most favorite channels of disclosure uh, on this tax sensitive data and uh, a written policy is, is highly recommended uh, also to, uh, to enclose and, and get the CFO on board on, uh, on the way you manage it. And, and last but not least, it all is based on the, on the underlying assumption that you have a professional implementation of a corporate governance model for tax matters. Why is that? That's because in, in countries like Australia, this whole corporate governance uh, on tax matters is uh, is being applied to such a level that legal the legal the legal representative of the local entity will be held liable and accountable uh, for for these matters, uh, which makes uh, typically these people very nervous if there's not a good corporate governance model for tax matters in place. With that, um, I think uh, we we have sort of given you a high level uh, interplay between value chain analysis uh, as a trigger, a full value chain analysis as a trigger to full uh, tax transparency, but also have given you some suggestions on uh, corporate governance matter, which we feel might might often be overlooked, um, simply because they are relatively new. Uh, but certainly also because tax authorities are uh, paying a lot of attention to those. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we will have uh, another uh, webinar uh, in 
in two weeks, roughly two weeks from now. It's all on our website, so feel free to register again. Uh, there will be um, um, that will be the last topic on value chain analysis uh, this year um, in in the next uh, the next webinar. So I would like to invite you. But for now, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And with that, we uh, close this webinar for today. So have a nice day. Uh, have a nice evening. Uh, the attendees, thank you for attending our webinar. And if you would like uh, to read our article on quantifiable value chain, uh, please feel free to send us an email or uh, to mention this in the questionnaire you will be presenting after the end of webinar. Thank you.